Pastor Dave is uh, still awaiting the, uh, the coming of a new granddaughter. She's a little stubborn. Um, I mentioned to him, I think I know where that came from. So you want to be in prayer for Sarah and Brandon as they uh, are still waiting for this new one to come. He is there with them in Texas. Well, what should bring people together often tears them apart. Have you ever planned a vacation? You've gone through all the trouble. You're really excited. You, you've gotten the time. You, you worked out all the details and, and you've saved money and you've bought new things for the vacation. And as a dad, you know, the challenge of packing the vehicle, you know, we're excited about that challenge. How can we fit all the things that need to go where? And, and then we shove the kids in there and the kids are like, I can't breathe, but we're there. And we're excited about this trip and this journey. And you're so looking forward to making all these memories. And 20 minutes into this six-hour ride, everyone's screaming. They're hot and angry and frustrated. And you think to yourself, what have I done? What often should bring us together can often tear us apart. You ever been to a family reunion or a wedding or a funeral and there's some family drama that comes up and you walk away from that event wishing you could change your last name. <laughs> Maybe you go to a company picnic or a company retreat and, and you're excited about going and then at the end you're like fixing your resume to send off to other places because you're just kind of done. What brings us together can often tear us apart and certainly that is the case as we unpack the gospel in the book of Acts with the church. As relational people, God created us for relationship. First with him and then with others. We, in our flesh, will struggle in those relationships. And I hope this morning, as we kind of unpack and continue our study in the book of Acts, you'll be thoughtful about this truth, that what can bring us together can often tear us apart. And here at Geyer Springs, we're a family. And families, just like any other families, have disputes at times. But it's how we handle our disputes and our conflict that really is of great importance. You know, when, when families fight, typical families, you know, someone might lose their allowance or you might be grounded or maybe an earlier curfew or maybe you might even find yourself sleeping on the couch. But when churches fight, it impacts the community. It impedes the kingdom of God. Our spiritual health is at stake. And we know of churches who've never recovered over conflict. First Baptist becomes Second Baptist. Second Baptist weirdly becomes Harmony Baptist. Some of you will get that joke in a minute. <laughs> Worse yet, churches don't just split. They close their doors. And think about that just for a moment. No more worship. No more vacation Bible school, no more camps, no more senior adult functions or lunches, no more anything at that location among that community because that church couldn't get over the conflict. And my guess is if you as a family or maybe you've walked through some of those difficult days as a church, that might be in your history, your past, you might know somebody, I, I would guess that as those doors closed for the last time that many people probably forgot what the conflict was even about. How did it get to this place? Families fight, but we, the church family, need to learn how to fight fair. Actually, fight biblically, or better yet, not fight at all. So what do we do when conflict or disputes threaten our unity? What's our role? What's your role in the unity of the body? Not only the local body here at Geyer Springs as members and as those who are attending but really the, the universal church, we all play a role in how we keep each other together. We're going to continue our study in the book of Acts. We're going to be in Acts chapter 15. I invite you to turn there now as we discuss church conflict, united or untied. As we know about the gospel in the book of Acts, if you've been with us the last several weeks, we know the gospel's on the move. We know that the writer of the book of Acts is, is Luke, and he's describing the gospel. He's describing these young church planters starting to plant these churches. He's going to take off in the back, the back half of the book of Acts and begin to describe Paul's missionary journeys. And we know that as the gospel moves out of the way of Jerusalem, that there is opposition. A couple of weeks ago, we, we mentioned Herod killed one of the leaders there, James, and then he imprisons Peter. 
And the opposition is outside the church, but as the church begins to grow and these young, immature believers begin to think about the body of Christ, the opposition now is within the church. What has brought them together threatens to tear them apart. And so as we look at Acts 15, we're going to understand just a few things. Now this morning, we're not going to read the entire chapter. I'm going to overview some. We might read a few verses, and you're certainly invited to follow along with it. And we're going to take some time as we walk through this narrative to apply this to our lives today. So Acts chapter 15, we, we know a couple things as the story begins that Paul and Barnabas returned to Antioch of Syria. And, and while they're there, there are some men from Jerusalem who come down and, and they make some pretty sensational statements that are of great concern. Verse 1, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now these Jewish brothers are coming down and they're describing salvation for the Gentiles. And they're saying, unless you are circumcised, you may not be saved. Verse 2 of chapter 15. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and to the elders about this question. Now we know that this is called the Jerusalem Council. That this small church, these other little bodies of believers are going to the mother church, so to speak, going to the big Jerusalem church looking for counsel, looking for wisdom on this issue. Now the issue was a false doctrine. They were saying that you needed more than faith to be saved if you're a Gentile. And they believed the Gentiles should be received on the same basis that those Jews had been received through circumcision. A very simple way of looking at this this morning is this. Should Gentiles be required to become Jews in order to be saved? And certainly Paul and Barnabas think absolutely not. And they begin to debate this issue with these brothers from Judea. And the scripture says the word debate in the ESV, that literally means a formal discussion, a confrontation, a time set apart where they, they spoke into this issue. It wasn't something that was said in passing and they disagreed with and they began a little tussle and they, they moved on to Jerusalem. There was a very formal reality here that takes place. The, the church appointed Paul and Barnabas to go to Jerusalem. And they were going to make now, that journey. That journey is 250 miles. Would have taken the better part of a month, but they went on this journey to Jerusalem to seek out the wisdom of the truth of the matter. Should Gentiles become Jews to be saved, or are they saved by faith alone? And along the way, the scripture says in Acts 15 that Paul and Barnabas would stop and they would describe and, and share with others the, the, what God was doing among the Gentiles. And the, the scripture says that many rejoiced with them as they heard the testimonies of Paul and of Barnabas. And as they got into Jerusalem, the scripture says that they were welcomed there. But the debate continued. Some of the Pharisees spoke up and, and said that circumcision was necessary in order to keep the law of Moses. Look at Acts 15, verse 6. Very simple verse, but a very telling verse. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. You know, when it comes to false doctrine, when it comes to significant matters of the church, leaders need to come together and describe and understand what's really going on here. And they began this debate. Now, this initial meeting in Jerusalem is among leaders. Later on in the narrative, you're going to understand that the entire congregation is present. But it's interesting here that there are factions, but there isn't fracture. There are those who are taking sides, but they're not necessarily fighting. They've been able to disagree agreeable. And as they are agreeing to be agreeable, despite their disagreements, I believe that the Lord is honored here. So after a lot of debate in Acts 15, Peter finally speaks up. We know that Peter in the book of Acts is preaching to the Gentiles, and he defends the fact that salvation comes by faith that Gentiles don't need to become Jews in order to be saved. And Scripture says that, that Peter mentioned that God gave them the Holy Spirit just like he gave us the Holy Spirit, that the only factor that God has considered is the matter of faith, not of circumcision. So Paul, a leader, an apostle, says that we shouldn't burden these brothers, these Gentiles, with extra requirements for salvation. But just as we believe we are saved by grace, Peter says, so are they. Peter doesn't just preach to the Gentiles, he defends them. But the debate 
continues. And so after Peter gets up and, and describes these issues and, and, and makes the claim that, that the Gentiles no, need circumcision, but they can find Christ and, and be saved through faith alone, the Scripture says in Acts 15, 12, And all the assembly fell silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related the signs and wonders God had done. The signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. And after they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree. Now, there's a couple things happening here in Acts 12 through 15. One, we see that the, the assembly fell silent. Now, that's, a, that's a pretty stark contrast to all the debating that's been going on. Scripture says at the very beginning that Paul and Barnabas debated. It wasn't a small debate. It was a big debate. And they get to Jerusalem, and they're continuing to debate. I would imagine there's a lot of talking. But in this moment, there's a holy hush on the crowd. And Paul and Barnabas take that opportunity to speak about what God has done and how God has moved among the Gentiles. Then James. James, the half-brother of Jesus. James, the pastor of the Jerusalem church. James, who's probably the most noted man to get up and speak, waits till the very end. And he defends and affirms what Peter says. That God came to the Gentiles first, and God has spoken about this. Not only has he spoken through our brother Peter, But James does something interesting here. He brings in an Old Testament prophecy from the book of Amos there in verse 16. And Amos speaks of the fact that God had plans for the Gentiles to be a people that would be called by his name. And so what James is saying is, hey, Peter's right. Paul and Barnabas are correct. But not only are they right, but they're in agreement to what the prophets, what the Old Testament scripture has already said about these Gentiles. And as we lay that upon the backdrop of what we already know in Acts, of what the, the, the apostles and the leaders of the church would have already heard from Jesus, we understand very clearly that the Great Commission was to go to all nations, that God's and Jesus' intent for the disciples, those carrying out the gospel from Jerusalem, was to go be my witnesses among all nations. And so what James is saying is he's building a defense For the truth that Gentiles don't have to become Jews. There's nothing extra required of them for salvation. But God's plan is that all peoples, all nations, all tribes, all tongues would be a people for himself. The scripture reminds us that the nation should be glad for they are God's people. You know, often here in America, we get get a little egocentric. We begin to think about just our life right here. But truthfully, all around the world, in this moment and moments prior to moments to come, there are people among all nations speaking about the name of Jesus, having worship service just like ours. Now, they may be different than ours. But God's intent is not just that we, the West, would come to know him. God's intent is that all nations would come to know. And so James describes that and helps us understand that. And then he, he mentions something a little different. He says, James, James says that the Gentiles shouldn't become Jews, but they should hold to four requirements. Looking at verse 20, reminds them that they should avoid food sacrificed to idols. They should not be sexually immoral. That the Gentiles should not eat of what's been strangled, nor should they be around blood. So what's interesting here is James mentions they don't need to do this, but there's a requirement for this. What's going on here? Well, James is describing four requirements not for salvation, but for association. James is not saying that they must do these four things to be saved. Rather, for them to have good fellowship with their Jewish brothers, they need to come to an agreement here, keep away from those things so as to not pollute or cause these Jewish brothers to be impure. What's happening here is there's two cultures colliding. And as these cultures colliding, they're beginning to learn, how are we going to get along here? How are we going to work together? Because the Jewish brothers are like, listen, if we hang around Gentiles, we will become impure because they live their life to a different culture context. 
what are we going to do? Well, James thought about that. And as a leader, he said, I, it's important for the church to be together, for the Jews and the Gentiles to come together under the heading of the church. How can we make that happen? And so he asked the Gentile brothers, listen, can you abstain from issues related to blood, food that's been sacrificed to idols? If you can do that and remain pure sexually, then we will be able to have association. But if you don't keep yourself away from blood, if you don't follow some of those food laws, if you don't find yourself being sexually pure, then it's going to be a problem for us to be together as a church. So James was wise, asking those brothers to abstain from those things, not for salvation, but for association. And what's interesting here is that James, in that process, really begins to create unity among the brothers. And that's exactly what happens later through the narrative. The church at Jerusalem sends Barsabbas and Silas, leaders at the church, to go to Antioch, make that 250-mile journey with Paul and Barnabas to share the news that faith is only required for salvation. To share the news that in order for us to have good association with one another, there's going to be some moral requirements that come together. And they decided to write a letter. And that letter is kind of called out to action there, Acts 15, verse 24. Follow along with me. Acts 15, 24. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions that seemed good to us, having come to one accord. Unity here to choose men and to send them with you to our beloved, with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. We're going to send these men to share with you what we agreed upon. We are one accord here at this council of Jerusalem. Men from Antioch and men from Jerusalem coming together, leaders and apostles, those who are immature, those who are mature, coming together, the association together is decided on this matter. Verse 30 of Acts 15, so when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. Crisis averted, conflict resolved, unity is maintained. What did they do? They rejoiced. They were encouraged. News had come. This dispute is now over. The Gentiles don't have to become Jews. We praise God together. We've worked through it. What's interesting is that we didn't plan for the unity talk in Acts 15 to land on our combined service day. Now, I know some of you think Pastor Dave and I are really smart, but you've been foolish, okay? We didn't know this was going to take place on this specific day. We were trying to get through the book of Acts. We knew we had this July 4th weekend to kind of manage an opportunity for us to come together. It is not by coincidence that we're here together talking about being together. I love how the Lord simply works. So together, not separated by rooms, not separated by style, not separated in any way together, how do we apply this? Because whether you are a modern service or a blended service, whether you've been coming here for two months or for 22 years, we all play a role in how we function together. In a church our size, it's real easy for you to think that because you're sitting under the balcony or in the corner or of the balcony or in the back, it's real easy to think, I'm just here. I don't really play a part. But as a member, you have responsibility. And as one who's called into this community, we want you to have responsibility. That the intent of the body of Christ isn't that we have little pockets of people that are disengaged and they're present. Rather, we want big pockets of people all pouring into one another, helping each other, helping this mission take place. It's easy to think, well, we've got staff for that or we've got resources for that. God hasn't called the church to be staffed out. God's called the church to equip the family members to go do the work of the ministry. And that includes us coming together, taking some responsibility and owning this. So let's apply this a couple of different ways. One, we would be remiss if we didn't stop for just, a minute, for just a second and mention the realities of salvation here. That we are saved not by something extra, but by grace and faith alone. 
There have been men throughout time who've been trying to work their way into salvation, who, who thought, if I'm good enough, if I can give enough, if I can go to church enough, I will be okay. It isn't grace plus something. It's grace alone. And the scripture is very clear about that. But yet we in our culture still have people who are struggling with this. I met with a man this week who said these words, I think I'm a pretty good person. So I think I'll be able to have a relationship with God. I said, brother, listen, all of our best deeds are like filthy rags before the Lord. We can earn our salvation. It is given to us by grace alone. Listen, if we could earn it, that means we could do something to unearn it. And the gospel is perfect. His love, his grace needs not us or our abilities or what we think we can add to it to make it better or to make it complete. All we need is to receive the free gift of God's wonderful, matchless grace. We must continue to help our people understand this truth. That Ephesians 2 reminds us that we were dead in our trespasses. But God, who was rich in mercy, made us alive. Not God plus something else. Not God plus our works. Not God plus our money or our agenda. But God made us alive in him. We've been saved not by our works, let no man would boast, but by grace alone. But this passage isn't just about salvation. This passage is a model. It's a model for us. Now, there's, there's no commands here. There's no imperatives here that say we, the church, must follow this script. So I want us to be clear here. But as we read this narrative, I think it's a very simple model for us to adopt and for us to be thoughtful about what to avoid when it comes to handling disputes within the church. So if you've got a pen, write down these four words. Number one, Acts 15 encourages us to clarity. It encourages us to clarity. Now, if you are a husband of any length, your beautiful, wonderful bride has been speaking to you at some point, and you heard a noise. You heard words, but you know that you were distracted by something, and so your response was probably, uh-huh. Well, that uh-huh gave her a right to do many things that you may not be aware of. Can I get a new car? Uh-huh. We as husbands often don't listen very well. And so I'll take ownership of that. I don't listen very well. I'm a pretty distracted guy. If you know me well, I'm kind of a distracted person. And, and my beautiful wife of 22 years has had to handle that distraction. And so there will be times throughout our week where we're trying to manage our children comings and goings and our schedule and, and her work schedule. And, and we'll be talking. And I know that there are words that are coming out of her mouth. And I know that I've said, uh-huh. But then later... I'm confused as to what I said uh-huh to, but I dare not ask her. So then I have to play detective and try to find out what I agreed to so that I could work that out. It never works for me. I just go to her and say, babe, I, I just confessed before you and the Lord. I was not listening to you. I apologize. But when I seek clarity, it avoids the conflict. And I think the same is true here in this passage. It's, it's really throughout the entire narrative how the leaders of the church were seeking clarity. They were trying to understand who was right. This doctrinal issue was wrapped up in a cloud of confusion because some of these people were saying one thing, yet these people were saying another. And who is right? And what's interesting here is this is, this is of grave importance. This is not one of those church disputes about the color of carpet or should we have pews or chairs or the song selection. This is, this is a big deal. But instead of going to war, instead of getting the fists out and, and, and starting to fight with one another, they sought out clarity. They sought wisdom. They appointed leaders to go to other leaders to have a formal conversation to work this out, to really truthfully understand what would be the right way to handle this dispute. I think conflict starts most because we don't seek clarity. 
we become evil Knievel and we jump to conclusions. Or we assume way too much. We make our own assessments. And as a result, we are often in the dark and not in the light. When we seek clarity, we can avoid conflict. They sought clarity a couple of different ways here. They went to leadership. These men realized, hey, there are some things here that are beyond me. I might not be mature enough or, or knowledgeable enough to really answer this question. Let me go to those who are smarter than me, more mature than me. Seeking the wisdom of others is a very biblical response to how you can avoid conflict. And that's what they did. Leaders went to Jerusalem. They realized, hey, those leaders were under the teaching of Jesus. They had authority. They were trained in this. Let's go seek clarity by seeking out leadership. But it wasn't just they sought out leadership to seek clarity. They also remembered what God had been doing prior to this issue. They went back and began to look at the experiences that God had initiated among the Gentiles. We saw that in Paul and Barnabas as they were traveling. They were sharing what God was doing among the Gentiles. Verse 7 of Acts 15, Peter describes that God took the initiative in helping the Gentiles come to faith. Paul and Barnabas again in verse 12 in front of the Jerusalem council describe how God was working among the Gentiles. Listen, if God is at work in a situation, maybe the best thing for us to do is to step back and let God do the work. When we think we know better than God, we will create significant conflict. So seek out wisdom. Seek out and remember what God had been doing in the past. And I think they went and were reminded of the prophets. We need to be reminded of the scriptures. Verse 15, James reminds the assembly, hey, the prophets have spoken of this already. Amos and others mentioned that Gentiles will become a nation under the name of God. So when we want to avoid conflict, we need to ask ourselves, what does the Bible say about this issue? You know, the Bible may not speak to very specific situations that you're in. The Bible doesn't speak to budget sheets or things in the church or youth ministry. There's no scripture of youth ministry in the Bible. How long a preacher should preach or the songs we ought to sing or how we ought to... There, there's not a lot of very specific situations that speak to the modern church, but, there, but there's a significant undergirding and foundation of how we ought to act as churches that are found in the scripture that will manifest in making wise decisions. Not just the church, the scripture speaks to all kinds of things in our family life, in our work life, how we relate to neighbors, how we handle those who may not like us very much. The scripture speaks to them. Seeking clarity means we look at the scripture but realizing not every conflict is in the word, but, every, but the word speaks to every conflict. And I think that's important for us to understand this morning. Let's look at some other applications here. And these other ones will be quicker than that one. So the first reality is that Acts 15 encourages us to clarity. I think Acts 15 also encourages us to ministry. It encourages us to ministry. Now, here's where the church conflict may be a little different than your work conflict or your conflict at home. We understand here that the ministry didn't stop just because there was a dispute. In fact, the scripture says that Paul and Barnabas, as they were making their journey to understand and to seek clarity and to get resolution to this problem, they were doing ministry. They were encouraging the brothers. They were giving testimony about what God was doing. And knowing Paul, although not recorded here, I'm sure he was teaching and preaching. And others in those villages and those regions were hearing about what God was doing. Ministry didn't stop just because there was a problem. And one of the ways we can continue that idea is very simply, let the main thing be the main thing. Our main thing here at Geyer Springs is the mission of reaching people for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and we do that a couple of different ways, but that's our mission here. We are a missional outpost here in central Arkansas to help others know who Jesus is. And when we keep our main thing the main thing, then all these other trivial things really remain that, just trivial. When we're focused on obeying God, when we're focused on carrying out his will, when we're focused on being his witness for the mission of God, all these other disputes, these little ideas, who really cares? Because are those things impacting the mission? Now certainly here in Acts 15, there was a doctrinal issue, and that certainly was a big deal. And I'm convinced that most of our church conflict 
it's really not doctrinal. It's, it's more personal. And so what the reality for us is this. We've got to keep the main thing the main thing. Let's make sure, just like the church did in Acts 15, that they continue to do ministry. We need to continue to do ministry. Ministry needs to remain a focus to maintain church unity. Number three, Acts 15 encourages us to family. It encourages us to family. Verse 4, Paul and Barnabas are welcomed at their church. Now, they're from Antioch and Syria. They're going to the church at Jerusalem. There are some at the church at Jerusalem that do not agree with Paul and Barnabas, but the Scripture says they were welcomed. They were, the Scripture, that actually literally means they were received. Just because there was a dispute didn't mean they didn't like each other. They were family. Now, we all have that one person, that one family member in our lives. Do you know what family member I'm talking about? Little crazy cousin Eddie, you know, the someone who just, man, just makes bad decisions, you know, and can't seem to get his life straight, or maybe it's just embarrassing, or maybe, you know, here in the South, we might call them a little redneck, whatever it might be. But we love them because why? They're family. We're able to put up with them because they're family. We may not agree with their lifestyle or their choices, but we love them because they're family. We are family. We do things together. We encourage one another. We support one another. We pray for one another. We love each other. But still in this big family, there are people that maybe we roll our eyes at because of what they say, or how they respond to things, but guess what? We're not going to shun them. Why? Because they are family. We're going to gather ourselves and get along because they're family. And I love this little idea in verse 4 that they were welcomed. They were received. They may have had some disagreements, but because they're family, they loved each other enough. And I hope and pray that's part of our model here at Geyer Springs, that although we may come from different backgrounds, we may enjoy different things, we may like one service over another service, or maybe we're a different generation, or, or, or maybe we just have disagreements about certain things, but the truth is we still love each other, we still accept each other, we're still caring for one another, supporting one another, praying for one another, encouraging one another. Why? Because we are family. Acts 15 encourages us to clarity, the ministry, and family. And last, obviously, it encourages us to unity. This is the result of all that's taking place. The strategy to speak to leaders, to seek the scriptures, to see what God was doing in the past, all brought unity. The title of the message today is Church Conflict, United or Untied? And if you were to look at those two words on the back of your worship guide, you would see that there's a lot of similarity to those words. And what makes such a stark difference between those two words is where you place the I. You as an individual are helping our body be united or helping our body be untied. We play a part and helping each other work through disagreements. And this is a great model for us because it's important for us to make sure that we're keeping the main thing the main thing, that we're loving each other despite disagreements, that if there's a formal disagreement, that we're working together with leadership to help find resolution. And when we do that, we still get to do worship services. We still get to have VBS. We're still doing camps and mission trips. We're a viable lighthouse of missional opportunity here in central Arkansas. Now, I want to be real clear. I, I don't know of any major disagreements here in our church. I, I think Geyer Springs is a brother and sisterhood of great love and encouragement. I love coming to church on Sunday morning. I love worshiping among our body. And there may be things that may be different for others, but for me as my outlook, I love the fact that that we love each other dearly. So I want you to understand that I'm not preaching this message because we have conflict. I'm preaching the message because that's where it lined up in our calendar. But when those conflicts come, when those disputes might come our way, I want us to understand the model that is set before us in Acts 15 with the Jerusalem Council so that we will continue to grow, so that we will continue to have ministry here and ministry around the world. It's of grave importance that we are united and not untied. So what role will you play in that? How will you respond to that? Could it be that today you need to go to a brother or sister and seek forgiveness? 
Could it be that today there's a leader that maybe offended you and you want to walk through that and, and really come to a place where you've not just forgiven them but are working with them as well? You know, Matthew 18 serves as a great example of how we're supposed to handle conflict interpersonally. And so I encourage you, if you're struggling with something or someone, work through Matthew 18. Seeking the wisdom of the Scripture will help you bring clarity. And as that clarity is brought, conflict can often be avoided. 90% of the conflicts that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis are really about confusion, not so much about conflict. I love how the brothers here in Acts 15 help us today in 2019 serve each other well.